in five minutes. But oh. If you want to do something now. <laughs> oh, they don't because they're so good. What you eating there, Bobby? <laughs> <laughs> I'm always eating right before these. I'm sorry. There's a bagel, just a bagel with butter, nothing fancy. Oh, okay. Not too crazy. Yeah. <laughs> you're right in between classes right now, right? But, or, you know, various yeah. different things you're doing right now. <laughs> yeah, Wednesdays are still my craziest day, even though I have uh, no more lab kids and um, the intro science topics. I just had yep. the 11 o'clock live show with my forsythia tree in the background outside. I figured I should do it for you guys too, but it's kind of a, a, a chore. I have to run this telephone line out into my front yard and have the Wi-Fi router sitting on top of a manhole cover you know, by my septic, <laughs> but just, to, just to make it look like it's effortlessly outside. <laughs> that sounds like a process. Yeah. yeah. And I figure, you know, and then I, the clouds are coming and I was like, you know, I don't know. I don't have to like in the middle of this scramble uh, for cover. So <laughs> I'll just stay inside to, for safety. But cool. yeah, it was nice because it was about being outdoors. And um, the whole time I'm talking, I have chickadees and, and chipping sparrows and white throated sparrows. It's almost like they're trying to steal the attention. So it was a, a way, a good way to have the class. That's cool. Boy, I tell you, we I feel like I've seen more wildlife. I don't know if it's just we're spending more time outside and seeing stuff or what, but um, just over the last few weeks, well, we've got a, we've got a, um, a, a fox has made a den in the backyard of our house. And so we see her and her husband yeah. and their four babies come out and play in the evening and in the morning. And then uh, uh, over the weekend, we saw a, a, a bear and two, well, yearlings, yearling cubs out in the backfield. Oh, so then, two cubs with the mom, the, the old the grown, grown up cubs? Yeah, wow. they were huge, unbelievable. And then, uh, cool. <laughs> and then for birds, the other day I saw for the first time, I'm like, what the heck is it? Um, and I think I figured it out. It was a common flicker on our lawn. And it was like a little bit bigger than a robin with a long pointed, uh, pointed snout. It was a little red cap on the back of its head. And it was going around picking the ground. It was really cool. Yeah, those are technically a woodpecker species, uh, by the way that they behave, but they're more omnivorous they're kind of uh they do the hunting for worms in the ground and in the trees so they're kind of a you know jack of all trades kind of bird but i've seen one doing the same thing behind my house by the raspberry bushes and really yeah, they're, they're yeah. really colorful yeah they're just they with spots and, oh, it's really and bright colors amazing oh yeah, so cool really and the cubs well the sad thing for those cubs you just saw is that uh june is the month when mom's uh, push away their young, yeah, their yearlings. They say, "All right, little ones, I'm done taking care of you. It's time for mama to get a, have another baby." So it's uh, that's why always when a lot of young bears get in trouble. And I had one that was sitting on my porch one time. It had found where I stored sunflower seeds in a metal container. It had the lid like a like a plate, and it was eating like this, just like the way you would eat, you know, <laughs> nuts out of a bag. <laughs> and it was so funny to watch it. I had to ch scare him off, even though it was really cute. I had to scare them off by banging on a pot and pan, you know, because, you know, oh, you they have to be afraid wow. of people. But it was so sad because I chased him up into a tree and he was making the sound that the bellowing sound that bears make when they're calling for their mom. And it was just in June. It was like, he probably is only a week uh -oh. since he parted from his mom. And he's like, mommy. <laughs> 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 no. That happened uh -oh. once in Connecticut and the poor thing was, couldn't get the lid open. It was just like, one of those elephants on a little ball in a circus, like <laughs> scrambling on top of the garbage metal garbage can full of uh, sunflower seed. And I was like, you poor thing. Yeah. <laughs> I wish I could just call mom. What do I do? <laughs> <laughs> no. Yeah, they're, so, they're such amazing animals. But I do know of one person who was uh, chased by one when they were jogging. And that's a very rare, but very scary thing, of course, if it ever happens. Uh, that was I, uh, I I worked uh, I worked with a physician over in uh, he was out of Franconia who uh, was attacked by a black bear. Uh, with, this was going back a while. I don't know early two thousands, and uh, um, it, he could have been killed. You know it was it was bad. And again in the woods jogging, and uh, with his dog of all things. Mm. 
Oh, yeah. um, so, it, so it's one o'clock, should we get started? I mean, I like these stories, we can keep going. <laughs> I'm totally happy. <laughs> um, but I wanted to go ahead and um, uh, Drew couldn't be with us, but my name is Leela Nordman. I work with the Fairbanks Museum Planetarium. Uh, this is our next installment of the COVID-19 update with Bobby Farley's Rubio, brought to you by the Fairbanks Museum and our partner, um, Northeastern, um, sorry, <laughs> Vermont Regional Hospital. Um, and uh, our, our two guests today are CEO, Sean Tester, and special guest, um, from Burktown um, Schools. She's their instructional coach uh, with Katie Handy. Um, so I'm going to hand this over to Bobby and uh, let you guys uh, take it away and give us our, our weekly update. Thanks so much. <laughs> oh, thank you so much, Leela. And thank you, Sean and Katie, for joining us. But um, as has now become sort of a tradition with our weekly updates, I'm going to start with uh, the raw numbers, which is never a happy thing to see. Oh, hold on a second. Uh, let me make sure I have the right website loaded up for you folks. <clears throat> All right, you should be seeing the now infamous Johns Hopkins dashboard for the global COVID-19 cases. And we are seeing that the number of people infected with this disease, this coronavirus has reached 3,691,683. Um, and unfortunately, 1.2 million of those folks are in the United States. So at this point, we have about a third of all of the cases on the entire planet, just in our own country. And globally, the in for the whole world, this coronavirus has already taken more than a quarter million lives, 258,256 for the entire world. If we click on the United States, we will see that sadly for our country, um, the number of deaths has already exceeded the number of American casualties in the Vietnam War. We're at 71,463 American lives lost to this pandemic. And, and unfortunately it is not anywhere close to being over. Uh, I wish I could say that it was that the end of this, but these numbers are gonna continue to increase. And so to move it to a local level, let's look at the state of Vermont's health department's dashboard. Uh, they've upgraded it recently and I recognize that font from the Johns Hopkins uh, one too. So the state of Vermont has 908 cases of COVID-19. We only have six people currently hospitalized, which is pretty impressive and 20 people under investigation. 706 Vermonters have recovered. So by far the most, uh, the majority of people who've had in Vermont are, are fine or okay now, but we did uh, have 52 deaths in the state. And uh, totally the, the state has only conducted 17,876 tests. And our Vermont population is a little under 700,000. So you can see that we, you know, a vast majority of the people in the state have still not been tested. So we don't really know how many people really have the COVID-19 out there, but um, if I go to MVRH's wonderful website, I got to say their dashboard uh, has some happy numbers, only in that the numbers are still low. Uh, there have been 648 tests conducted at MVRH, which is a great number for a small town like St. Johnsbury, but only 13 positives. And currently there are zero people hospitalized at MVRH with COVID-19. And speaking to Sean earlier, that's been the case for about three weeks now. There was a patient a while ago, but... Uh, so that means that the hospital is relatively quiet, I imagine. So with those numbers in mind, I wanna uh, ask Sean about this, but I do wanna mention one more thing. Um, the biggest fear that I personally have as a member of this community is that the fact that we've done such a good job of preventing this disease from spreading. I have to give props to everybody in Vermont who's been following the social distancing guidelines, wearing the masks in public, uh, following all the hygiene, like washing your hands, this has paid off. There are thousands of people who did not get sick because we've done this. But the idea that somehow we're past this problem or somehow we're over the hump is what I think is a dangerous notion only because it's creating the idea that maybe some people might think they can relax about this. And if we relax too much, we could be back at the beginning of the situation where we're seeing the numbers rising uh, rapidly. So I wanted to bring in one article that was on the opinion section of the New York Times, 
and I'm a subscriber, but the New York Times has made all of their COVID-19 coverage free for anyone, so anyone can read this. Uh, it's an opinion piece because of how you interpret it, but the numbers are facts that are not in dispute. And the title is, Don't Be Fooled by America's Flattening Curve. Um, and I think this is a very important way to think about this because this is a pandemic, but really we are such a big country that we've got to think about it from region to region, area to area. And Vermont is right now a place that's been spared, but we are a rural region. And generally speaking, the rural regions are catching up to what was happening in the bigger cities earlier. And so if you look at this uh, line graph, you can see the entire US, that's the flattening curve that we really wanted to see. And I'm happy that it does look that way. But if you scroll up, you can see that New York City is really the place where the downturn is happening. And if you take out the data from New York City, you can see that the rest of the United States is still increasing. Um, and you know, I, I, if you for, go further down, you can get into more detail, but I thought the, uh, Texas was a particularly useful ref, reference point for us because we think of ourselves as a small state, Texas is huge, but there are towns in Texas that are farther apart than we are from New York City. So think of us as being in the quiet zone of the Northeast and we've got the hot zones down in uh, New York City, New Jersey. And then if you look at this graph for Texas, you can see that Houston is where the biggest decline has occurred. But if you take the Houston data out, you know, like New York is our Houston, you know, we're the rural areas. Without Houston, you can see that the increasing uh, numbers are happening. And that's what I'm afraid of. If people hear the news, oh, New York City's past the worst, the numbers are going down they might assume that that's the case where they live too. And, and that is not uh, you know, happening everywhere. So I'm not gonna spend any more time on this, but I just want folks to realize that this is a regional thing and every region is, a, is facing a different situation. I'm just very grateful uh, and I'm very happy to, you know, that I live in a community where everybody's taking this so seriously that we are one of the places where it's spreading the least. But that doesn't mean that that's a guarantee. And it's all because of our actions. And so our actions could possibly reverse these trends if we start acting foolhardy. So with that in mind, uh, I want to toss it over to you, Sean, because uh, over at MVRH, you, uh, in addition to being very prepared for COVID-19, you also have all the other responsibilities that a hospital normally has, um, all the other illnesses and injuries that might cause someone to go there. Uh, and I've also heard that the governor is now allowing some elective surgeries, which means some of the ordinary business of the hospital is going to slowly start to return. So I wanted to ask you, how are things at the hospital and how are things slowly transitioning? I wouldn't say back to normal, but uh, into a closer to normal status. Sure. Yeah, uh, well, we're we're excited by the uh, governor's support in this. Um, Actually, the whole Vermont hospital and health system has been working closely with um, with the administration on what the strategy should be and how it should look so that we can do this uh, safely for our patients and our communities. And so we have really been ready for this. Um, I think our staff are frankly really ready to get back working and serving our patients again as well. Um, I think some of the big changes, of course, uh, you know, we had done so much uh, back in March to ramp up for this anticipated uh, big wave that, that we're relieved we didn't uh, have hit our community. And uh, so some of the things that we put in place, like the respiratory intensive care unit that I've talked about in our day surgery um, center, we had to undo that. We've moved our RICU now, so it's on the same floor as our med surge and right next to our ICU, which means that it's easier for staff to manage patients who come in who either may be COVID positive or are in fact COVID positive. And uh, that meant getting back to reconverting our that space back into the uh, day surgery unit. So we've done that work over the last several days and it's ready to go. Um, the other thing is just making sure educating all our staff in the proper pro, uh, procedures and protocols for how we use protective uh, equipment um, and how we care for patients when they come into the hospital. A lot of the things that we've done over the last several weeks, we're not going to undo. So for example, when you come to the hospital, you're going to have your temperature checked. We're going to ask you to wear a mask. We're going to still screen you. Those things are really important to uh, identify people who may be symptomatic 
and isolate them from the rest of the, um, fr from our staff as well as, as other patients. Um, yeah, so it's sort of like uh, the hunkering down for the long haul versus the, the sudden surge that you were anticipating. And so I imagine that there's still probably difficulty getting all the equipment, but you probably have a stockpile that you're building up uh, in case we do see or yeah, we, we have some stuff. There, there are a lot of things that uh, we feel we're, we're in pretty good shape on. Uh, one of them are these standard surgical masks. Uh, we have, you know, through our own uh, sourcing that has started to open up a little bit, but also through our partners that really did a went above and beyond to support us. Uh, EHV Weidman, um, the St. J. Academy, leveraging their contacts in Asia to get a supply. Uh, the one thing that we still struggle with is these uh, N95 masks that you hear everybody talk about. Mm -hmm. uh, they're still on allocation and access to them is still limited. But one thing that's really helped is we were given uh, by the state of Vermont a sterilizer that enables us to sterilize equipment like N95 masks so that they can be reused. And we are performing that. So we're keeping our N95s, we're, we're marking them and we're ster sterilizing them so that our staff can reuse them. And that can be done up to 10 times per mask. So it basically takes a limited supply and multiplies it by 10. And that will help us in the coming months. And I'm hoping that by, by the end of the summer, uh, the supply challenges around N N95s are resolved. Well, I'm, I'm fascinated by this sterilizer. Is this like an autoclave or sort of like a heat process or uses chemicals or? Uh, yeah, I think heat, you know what? I better not say exactly what it is because <laughs> you know, I'm the guy up here that doesn't know anything. Um, but uh, yeah, basically it safely sterilizes the equipment. It's a big cabinet. You put them, put the items in, in a tray. It's, a, it's not quite an autoclave, but I think the principles are similar. Yeah. Um, the other thing I want to mention about the sterilizer is we have community partners who also need PPE. So uh, our EMS providers, Calax, Linen Rescue, uh, the fire departments, um, uh, area uh, nursing homes. And uh, we are uh, part of our agreement with the state, and we're happy to do it, is uh, we are sterilizing their PPE as well. So we're working on standing up the procedures to enable us to do that efficiently and effectively and make sure everybody gets their PPE back. All right, and this is something that was never done in the past, right? Uh, sterilizing equipment in this sort. Uh, well, I, it just- You know, that, that's the, I'm sorry, Bobby, but that's the kicker. You know, you got a mask that costs them. Well, these are really, in normal times, these are really cheap, but the N95s are still relatively expensive. You use it, you throw it out, right? It's not a big deal. But these commodities have now become, you know, very precious items. Well, I, I feel like this is on the long list of things that are going to be better adaptations. Uh, you know, the, the, the time of tragedy is going to make us all better at how we handle resources, hopefully a little more conscientiously. I, it is crazy to think I've, I've used N95 masks and thrown them out. I never would have imagined to think of that as a precious thing. Um, and maybe if we, we, if we all did before this time, we wouldn't be having this problem. You know, the disposable uh, culture that we've uh, come up with is maybe coming back to haunt us. Well, Bobby, I would say, you know, one of the cool things is when you think about it, um, what we were able to do to create, to build our new RICU on the med surge floor, which includes four, four rooms now in a negative pressure environment, that's something we never had before. I mean, we had negative pressure in, in the ICU and we had negative pressure room in our emergency department. But that, what we're now calling our RICU, we're calling it our RICU intentionally. It's not a COVID unit. It's a respiratory intensive care unit. This, is, this can be used for people with uh, you know, measles, anything that is air transmissible. It's a much safer environment for us to be able to care for and treat those patients without having the risk of spread. So that's one of those adaptions and innovations that will uh, pay off in spades in the long run. Yes, I mean, I think uh, that, that is great because I, right now, a lot of us have, I've recently gone through the VOSHA training and I know a lot of other Vermonters are preparing for a, a different version of their job, but a lot of people are gonna be going back to work. And so uh, I think a lot of people are worried about the fact that all this social distancing and all that uh, has worked, but if we start, 
getting out there and started going to work, we're naturally going to start seeing an increase in transmission. And it seems like the hospital is going to stay ready. It's not, uh, it's not standing down in any sense of the word uh, as far as no, preparedness. Not at yeah. all. We see this in many ways as the new normal. This is going to be with us a long time. And as we open up, like you said, you are probably naturally going to see an increase in the number of people uh, who test positive or uh, are carrying the virus. So, uh, and I want to stress, I, I know you already mentioned it once, Bobby, but I, I, I think we can't stress enough times, you know, our success depends on everybody in our community um, taking appropriate measures. So, you know, I come back to the basics, right? Wash your hands. The virus is killed by soap. You know, use proper hand washing techniques. Take your time, right? Do it right and do it well. There's some great videos online if you have any questions, but that's incredibly important. Wash them often. You go outside, you're in a community, when you get home, you wash your hands. You interact with somebody, wash your hands. Do it regularly, do it often. Number two is, um, you know, it's still important, even as we start to open up, to practice some social distancing. You know, if you're getting together with friends, you don't have to be right on top of each other. Um, if you uh, feel sick at all, then then stay home from work. You know, th th that's incredibly important as well. You know, we, we have to respect that in people and our employees, that, that's gonna be necessary. Um, and, and finally, when I'm out in public, you're gonna see me wearing one of these. When I go to the grocery store, when I, when I go anywhere, I'm gonna put this on because I'm protecting myself, but more importantly, I'm protecting you, right? I'm protecting all of you. So, um, so that's gonna be incredibly important. And I wanna say how we interact with others when we, because we're gonna see a lot of people are, this is tough for people. This change has happened so quickly. This is a change in norm and behavior. You know, it's part of the culture in Asia to wear masks for a lot of reasons, but it's not part of our culture here. When you see somebody who's not wearing a mask, it's not your responsibility or our responsibility to go up and criticize them. But I think what we need to do is when we see somebody else wearing a mask, thank them, express gratitude, or share positive stories about how when you're going out in public that you are wearing a mask. How we, how we share and socialize this, I think is gonna be incredibly important in getting the message across and getting more and more people to do it in the months and possibly years to come. Well, I, I, I heartily agree with everything you've just said, Sean. I think it is a matter of, uh, a lot of people have a mentality before this pandemic that you know, your, your personal health is just your business. You know, like, oh, you know, and I think this has made us realize that when we talk about health, we're talking about a shared resource. It's like a common space. You know, it's not just me, whether I'm sick or not, or I don't care if I get sick. That's irrelevant. What I think about myself, I have to think about all the people around me. And so uh, I know that some people hear all oh, the masks are optional. Therefore, I opt not to wear one. Um, you know, and I, I, I said to you before the show, but, you know, kindness and uh, p being polite are also optional. But I don't think anybody goes around saying, ah, I don't need to be polite. I, you know, I mean, those are considered uh, unfriendly and, you know, antisocial behaviors. And I don't want to, like you said, I don't want to go around policing my neighbors and telling them they must wear a mask. So I like your approach about being more positive about it. Uh, the positive reinforcement of when uh, to thank someone for wearing it. But I, 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 you know, I think we've seen in the news, there have been even some violent confrontations uh, even fatalities related to the conflict over wearing a mask. And I don't, and I don't want anybody <laughs> to put themselves at risk by going out and policing the public. That is not your job. Um, but I think, you know, your job is just like your, you know, in society, you, you're, you don't force people to be polite, but you be polite yourself and you show a good example. I think wearing a mask in public is the new normal of polite behavior uh, and being considerate. Uh, and and like you said, uh, I think people also the the folks who think more individually and not uh, about all their neighbors they 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 I don't wear a mask because I don't want to I don't care if I get sick so I'm not going to wear a mask. They're not realizing that these masks, especially the fabric ones, their real purpose isn't really in preventing you from getting sick as much as it is from preventing you from spreading it to others. So I I, I can't repeat this enough about it's a form of caring. It's a form of showing 
your love to your community when you wear a mask and ignoring the the rules and social distancing isn't a violation of the law but it is a, it's rude uh, I, I would say that it's fair to say it's impolite it's rude and it shows that you don't consider your neighbor's health in addition to your own so uh yeah it's, I, I feel like uh we're a new etiquette a new manners you know all, new, all all kinds of new rules are coming up from this time but sean i also wanted to ask of uh, an ongoing story about NBRH's involvement uh, with COVID-19 has come from the, the, the correctional facility in St. Johnsbury. And I know that the hospital is working very closely with them. Uh, and every update we've gotten so far has been that most of the prisoners have been asymptomatic and no one has needed uh, any significant treatment. And so are, are things ramping down or is that continuing to be a sort of a constant source of, uh, of you know, interest? You know, um, I think we've been uh, very uh, pleased with our partnership with the um, correctional facility and their engagement and ongoing communication with us has been um, has been very good. Um, my understanding is that uh, the vast majority of the inmates who have tested positive have been either asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic. We have not cared for a single uh, um, inmate here at NVRH uh, for, for those symptoms. Um, the, my understanding is that they've been struggling because they've been doing uh, ongoing tests of the, of the um, prison population there. And they're waiting to get, I think it's two negatives back before sending them back to their, um, to their, uh, their home. And uh, they've been struggling with tests coming back negative then positive. And I think it has to do with part of it is probably our lack of understanding of the virus and what viral shed looks like and whether it's dead proteins or not that are, uh, um, that they're, they're, they're generating those positive tests. But I think that has slowed the, 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 the kind of transition of people back. But I mean, meanwhile, I think they've identified other positive patients that have come in, but it's not been, uh, overwhelming. Yeah, it's like a constant in and out. The, those who are are recovered right. are going back to their original prison, and then new ones are coming in. And also, of course, of great concern are the the staff, the correctional officers, and the staff. At, and none of them have, uh, as far as you know, been affected by this. Uh, Not my knowledge. Yeah, no. because that was uh, I think that was the big concern the community had that these folks who are relatively new to the safety protocols were now on the front lines of treating COVID nineteen patients. So it's happy. It's a happy fact that um, that hasn't spread outside of the correctional facility through the workers. Um, well, uh, I have to ask you, Sean, uh, you haven't yeah. been at NVRH for very long. This is a little bit more about your career. How long ago did you become the CEO at the hospital? Yeah, it's been about a year and a half, Bobby. It was uh, November 26th, uh, 2019, that I joined the team here. Well, and, yeah, it's been a wild <laughs> been a wild ride I tell you if anybody told me that this is what we were in for I don't know what I would have done my hair is a lot grayer um, <laughs> that's that was my thought because I can only imagine that when you first uh, took the job you're thinking oh a nice quiet hospital in a rural uh, you know part of Vermont this should be so peaceful and then all of a sudden you know everybody who works in a hospital is now suddenly faced with something that no one alive today has done before so uh you know i i i, I sympathize with that because I, this is probably not what you envisioned your first a couple of years <laughs> looking like but i guess no. <laughs> it's only a it's a, it's only a, a good training i bet you're only going to be better at your job i imagine from now on after all this ordeal um, yeah, I think but, I, if I can get if I can get through this, you know, I can probably get through anything. Yeah, the, but the uh, <laughs> I want to stress it's it's really the team here. We've got a fantastic team. It's everybody from the clinicians, our nursing staff, our our support services, food services, laundry, um, our our environmental services. The team that are responsible for cleaning our rooms and keeping this place um, uh, microbe free. You know, everybody's really just does a fantastic job. And, and, and we came into this with a really strong team in a, in a strong financial position too, which not a lot of hospitals can stay, especially rural hospitals. You know, rural healthcare is tough. And I think that the strength of our team and our financial strength has enabled our resilience as, we, as we've navigated this very challenging, challenging time. Well, and on the financial side, um, because of the fact that you haven't been able to do all the surgeries and the other kinds of elective procedures, 
is the hospital. I mean, I know there's maybe funding available to support you to the, yeah. to make up for that, but uh, how is the hospital managing finances? There isn't any concern that this is going to damage the hospital in the future. Uh, all this. Uh, you know, I, I wax and wane between uh, being really, uh, really fearful and optimistic. Um, you know, NVRH is not going anywhere. I will, I will tell you that. You know, we're gonna, we're gonna get through this, and we're gonna be here to serve our community for generations to come. Um, it, at the same time, this is a serious financial hit, and it's gonna require a lot of work to recover from. Um, you know, when you look at the way hospital, uh, the financials are structured, how money flows through the system here, it's, you know, we basically turned off the spigot for two months. And um, that's not even as we start to, you know, turn our spigot in lockstep with the state, um, it's going to be a slow process. And we're going to need our entire community support to, uh, to navigate this and get through it. Well, um, I don't know if uh, other than uh, the, the social distancing and the hygiene practice that we're all doing, yeah. are there, and I know that there's many members of the community that have been doing great things, uh, like supplying food for your workers, and, and, oh, and I know people have been bringing yeah. in masks and gowns, so I, I, we've met some of the folks like Kim Beer who are helping these projects, so I'm so happy. Is there anything that the ordinary Vermonter, the ordinary uh, citizen of the kingdom can do uh, to help the hospital? I mean, there might be a charitable contribution, but I'm also thinking of, is there any way that we can, uh, a frame of mind that you would recommend that we think about the hospital that might help in the future? Because I think if anything, this has taught everyone, no matter how well or sick you are, that the healthcare system is so crucially important. Yeah. And I think of MVRH as like our home team and you're like the, the manager of the, the team, uh, you know, like, like we're so proud of our team. I think I, I personally am that we are in safe hands but the idea that this hospital uh, under normal circumstances was could be struggling, I don't know what we could do, advocate certain positions or what we can do out in the community uh, to make sure that we all have a hospital within reach. Because one of the scariest things I've seen is looking at other parts of the country and seeing how much distance between hospitals people have. I mean, there are many people that have to drive hours to get to a nearby hospital in rural areas, you know, states that are not that different population wise, like Vermont, you know, Wyoming, for example, if you live out there, you might have to drive several hours to get to a hospital. And I don't want to ever see that happen in a rural area. And I don't want to happen in Vermont. So I don't know if you have any last tips for us as citizens, what we could do to help strengthen the hospital on for the permanent long haul, you know, as to make sure yep. that you're always on good footing. Well, here is my, um, what I would like to say, Bobby, is, you know, throughout this whole crisis, the hospital's been here for the, for the community. We pivoted on a dime to make sure that we were prepared in case we did see an upswing of COVID positive patients. And uh, like I said, we're committed to being here. We're going to get through this together and we're going to continue to serve our community for generations to come. Um, that's really important to me. You know, I mean, I, I grew up here in the Northeast Kingdom. Both my boys were born at this hospital and it has served my family for a very long time. The one ask that I have as we begin to open back up and are able to start serving our patients again is for our entire community, buy local, get your care here. We have amazing providers. We've got a great surgical team, great orthopedics team. We've got great primary care. Our women's wellness program is, is phenomenal. We've got a, a top shelf birthing center. For those of you who haven't seen it, um, you know, it's a great place to, uh, you know, start your family. Um, please get your care here because the more care we provide, the stronger we will be and more able to continue to support everybody in our community. Oh, I will repeat that. Get your health care locally. Uh, I think Vermonters appreciate and understand the value of that in every other aspect with food and, and other things. So why, why, why be different with health care? We, we are fortunate to have lots of big cities nearby with very famous and prestigious hospitals. And maybe that sometimes hurts NVRH, but I, I, I'll repeat it over and over again. I'll tell everybody yeah, that, that shop locally when it comes to getting your health care and make sure that MVRH is always strong um, because this COVID-19 pandemic has proven not only that 
that we need the hospital, but that that NVRH is up to the challenge and is very much ready for anything. So uh, our time together has just about ended, Sean. And uh, I think we're going to have another one of these updates next week. I don't know who I'll speak to from NVRH, but if it's not you, I want to thank you for all your leadership and guidance there and for being such a you know honest voice uh, for the hospital. But also, I think everything that NVRH has done has greatly reassured our community. Um, I, and I think that that peace of mind, the, the, the knowing that there is a place ready for everything uh, helps a lot of people get through this terrible time. So I want to thank you for leading such a great team of people. And uh, I want to thank you for joining us and sharing that with us on these weekly updates. And I, if I don't see you again next week, uh, you know, uh, stay well. And and I, I'll hope to see you around uh, town. I hope I'll recognize, we'll recognize each other. <laughs> We're in a mask. Yeah. I'm the guy with a lot more gray hair than he used to have, Bobby. <laughs> yeah. Well, maybe that's a, our, our, maybe our face masks are going to become eventually like a photograph of our smiling face so people will recognize That's right. <laughs> <laughs> or see through ones. <laughs> but anyway, Sean, um, it's been great. And uh, thank you for, uh, for being such a positive force uh, in our community. So thank you. And give a great thanks to everyone at MVRH. Every level of that hospital is, uh, you know, some of the greatest people in this community right now. So thank you thank very you. much. Well, we're, we're incredibly grateful for our relationship with the Fairbanks Museum. And Bobby, I think you guys are doing a fantastic job. Oh, well, we miss, we miss seeing the public, but we're so happy that we can give people the information they need to know. And thanks for being a part of that, Sean. And stay well. And I'm going to toss it over now to our new guest. Thank you, Sean. Well, all right, folks. Now, for the second half of our COVID-19 update, we have uh, a guest uh, from educating uh, the youngest of the kids in our schools. Katie Handy is an instructional coach at the Burke Town School. But this, all of us who have dealt with kids or, or parents or teachers know how difficult this time has been uh, for kids who are out of school. I mean, some of them might be having fun, but a lot of them might be you know, missing all their friends and their teachers and their community. And I think all of those effects are even greater for the youngest learners. Um, it's really hard for kindergartners and first graders and second graders to wrap their head around what's going on. I mean, us grownups have barely been able to cope with this situation. So I wanna ask you, Katie, how, I mean, you work with the most sensitive and the most uh, vulnerable of our students. So how has that been for you as an educator in this uh, time? So as an educator, I coach um, groups of teachers. So they're the ones doing largely the interacting with those students, but it has been stressful and a change for many of our students. Um, you know, they have fears about the virus. Um, you know, is it gonna come get them? Is someone in their family going to get sick? And those are all rational fears to have. And, you know, our job as educators continues to be to first and foremost, put health, safety and self-care for both students and families at the forefront of our interactions, but also um, through virtual meetings we're having with students um, and keeping those routines and phone calls, really just acknowledging that those feelings are normal. And as adults, we're having them too. And that there are ways we can still connect and be physically distant. And our goal really at my school has been to empower kids that they can be those agents of change to help their community stay safe. Um, so they can wear their masks, they can wash their hands, they can stay home and how they can play a vital role in this. Well, that's great. I mean, I know that kids take those things seriously when you tell them, you know, that what they, their actions have an impact. It's one of the best things about kids at that age is that they, they really take those things seriously and they don't dismiss them like maybe our adolescent might, uh, might be more likely to do. Um, but you're an instructional coach and you work with teachers on how to deliver curriculum and all of the plans that you may have had for the school year are so different. I mean, how has this affected your job? I mean, I, I imagine the teachers that you work with uh, are needing advice of a totally different kind uh, like with Zoom and all the technology all in addition to curriculum. Yeah, so, you know, my role has shifted quite a bit uh, in terms of 
access points and what technology works best. And, you know, a big challenge for us in K2 um, in our community and environments in the Northeast Kingdom has been access and equity um, through, as you can see, I'm sitting in my car right now, internet access that's reliable and steady, but also for our young learners, um, their ability to access devices has been huge. So we've been really creative in ways that we present information, both synchronously with students um, in live chat, but asynchronously through um, work packets we've been able to send home via our food delivery bus route and pickups. Um, so really a lot of the work has been around what engages students and how do we keep that engagement up given the warmer weather that is coming and you know they don't want to sit in front of a worksheet in a packet and neither do we <laughs> so, <laughs> how do we continue to engage kids and some of the ways that i've worked with staff around that are around learning menus and choice boards so putting that power back into young learners hands that they have a voice in how they learn so you have to be able to prepare curriculum for students that are online and have that availability. And then also for students that mm -hmm. may rely on the mail as their only source of uh, input, right? Mm -hmm. So I imagine this is so much harder than it would be during a normal school year when at least all the kids are in one place. Yeah, it's actually been way more time consuming. You know, teachers are really having to work hard to set themselves some personal boundaries so they're not on the phone or a, a, a Google Meet ha a chat all the time because it is stressful and it does take a lot longer to decide which critical concepts we want to address. We're very fortunate that we've identified those as a district and then how do we present that to students? And I will say the K2 team at Burke has just done this fabulous job of creating um, these packets that they can send digitally, but also print that offer digital access, but also offer choices that get students outside or um, bring experiential learning in that require no digital access at all. Yeah, it's it is unfortunate that the the digital divide is very strong in the Northeast Kingdom. Um, we have people every range of communication technology. Um, so it's like your, your job is multiplied in the amount of stuff that you have to do. Are the packets being delivered along with the uh, the meals or is that a separate thing or are you using the regular post office? Um it really has depended at the very beginning before students left, we did try to send them home with a couple weeks worth of work, not knowing where the situation would go. Um, since then we've had last week, we had a delivery or a pickup system um, using social distance protocols for families to come pick up new sets of books and work or any materials and sneakers they may have left behind. But then things that weren't picked up are being delivered via the bus route or via mail. Yeah, and I, I, I mean, we spoke to Principal uh, Millington from Barnett School a couple weeks ago, and she was saying that they were delivering, uh, I think, around 200 meals a day. Mm -hmm. Is that pretty comparable? I mean, Burke is a, a little bit smaller school, but not much uh, than Barnett. So, yeah, I can't speak to the exact numbers of what we're delivering for meals because it is a larger system mm -hmm. within our Kingdom East District where meals are being made at two different schools and uh, then loaded on buses and delivered to all seven towns. Yes, I, I should mention that. Yeah, you're part of the Kingdom East Supervisory Union, which is a bigger uh, organization and because transportation and food service are centralized within the Supervisory mm -hmm. Union. You said there's two schools that are doing all that cooking for the whole district, uh, the whole SU. Yep, and then there are buses from each town with staff members aboard that do the delivery routes each morning. It, you, it hasn't fallen on you and doing deliveries, has it? <laughs> it is a volunteer basis. I have not yet been able to get on a delivery route, um, but I, I will say we do have some staff who have really gotten into it and um, dress up as a new character every day and greet students at the bus stops as, you know, Little Red Riding Hood or um, something else, which has been really great and comical. Well, I, and that, that is the kind of thing that especially the younger kids really, you know, makes their day, helps all the troubles uh, out of their mind when they have fun like that. And I really appreciate adults that are willing to be silly for the sake of uh, sanity. Uh, <laughs> I think that's a really admirable thing. And I really look up to those folks. Plus, uh, this is for the folks who are not familiar with the Northeast Kingdom in towns like Burke and Linden and Sutton. Right now, it's still mud season. It's still tough to get out there. The roads 
are you know challenging i've said it before so people who grew up where i did in miami our roads make them think they're in an indiana jones movie <laughs> <laughs> you know so so this is no small task to deliver meals every day and um the one thing i i mean i, I, I you're in a, a hot spot at the school uh, I know there may have been Wi-Fi on the parking lot before, or is this something that was set up specifically for this? Um, the Wi-Fi at Burke has been accessible from our parking lot. I've been here nine years and I've never had an issue logging in from here. Same thing in Newark, but they did um, uh, put in a hotspot. I believe it was Linden. And then I think one out towards Concord way. Yeah, those have become essential. Uh, I'm happy to hear that our representative in Congress, Peter Welch was talking about mm -hmm. pushing for funding so that we finally do get this universal broadband that we've been promised for years. And uh, and I think that this time and your situation, the fact that you're sitting in a car is proof of how important this is. I mean, without the internet, it would be hard to imagine coordinating all of this response. Um, but given that there are people who in the Northeast Kingdom and in, in the towns that you serve that are remote, hard to reach, there are a lot of people without internet. Uh, there are people who live in pretty rustic conditions in some cases and I know that there might be some kids who have difficulty accessing all of this and I don't know uh, if, that, if that's specifically what you address but how do you handle for example the grades or the um, you know the succession to another grade for a kid who may be out of contact with you guys or you've lost touch with them so I will say we've been very fortunate in terms of not losing contact. Our district has been really great. We've been making phone calls with students um, for families who have limited minutes. We've been providing minutes to ensure that continuous contact does happen. Um, in terms of our district, our focus is on engagement and not around those proficiencies you probably heard a lot about in the fall around proficiency based learning throughout our state and those initiatives. So really our goal is really around engaging students, really fostering a growth mindset and a love of learning and focusing on some really broad critical concepts. Um, how we report that to families is going to look very different and is still something at a district level that they're working on um, that teachers are giving feedback about. But it's really, again, about were they present? Um, did they um, participate in whatever means that they could? And what assets did they bring? What growth towards learning did they show during this time? Um, as assessment is just formative and observational, it's not as formal and summative as we typically would expect this time of year. Yeah, no S backs and all that. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I, and as you said, I, I'm very aware as part of my education too, that outdoors is becoming ever more appealing as a place to learn. And mm -hmm. I know it's one of those, uh, you, you can't fight that too much. You wanna get kids to go out there. Um, so how have you adapted the curriculum for that? Because I imagine you now that kids are home, there's a whole different level of expectation, but there's also opportunity to go outside and look for things that, you know, in their own backyards, a little bit of more independent uh, study. For kids that are K through second, that's not an easy thing for them to manage. Some of them might mean, might take that as an excuse to do nothing, or some of them might be very, engaged and have their curiosity already turned up fully. So let me, uh, uh, what kinds of activities or, or lesson plans are you uh, encouraging to help get kids outside, but still continue to learn? Yeah, so we have actually a couple unique things happening with that. We are really focusing on some integrated learning opportunities, but also thematic studies in the weeks coming forward based on student feedback and parent feedback, but also teacher feedback um, about what's working and not. And they at Burke have decided to do thematic units this week. Um, they sent a packet home that was all around chicks and chickens. Um, because that was really a hot topic for a lot of our students. So some students are bringing their chicks on live screen. They've been had the opportunity to do some reading um, asynchronously and hard copy about chicks, um, listen to some read alouds about chicks, but also, you know, crack open an egg in their kitchen and study the different parts that they might see. Um, in coming weeks, we have things like mud pies which coming back to the mud is a really great thing. So 
we've provided recipes to make mud pies and you know how can you incorporate counting how many tablespoons full of water is it going to take you to make that mud nice and thick what's the sensory feel how many different daff uh, dandelions can you put on top to decorate <laughs> uh, dandelions are coming soon and that is perhaps the flower that kids love the most. <laughs> um, really yellow and fun. Um, another really cool opportunity for young learners to reinforce um, letter formation um, that we've posed is to take things out in nature, um, sticks, twigs, rocks, and actually form those letters and make the alphabet um, to do some more authentic counting or forming of numbers with items in nature. So just how can we get more organic than that paper pencil stuck at the table? Well, I, as an outdoor educator, I'm loving all of this. And, and I, I'm looking at the bright side of all of this is that these are things that you're incorporating now out of need, but eventually when, if things do become normal again, this is, I don't see any reason why they shouldn't continue being part of uh, kids' education. So I, I'm grateful that you're making great lemonade from the lemons of this uh, time that we're in. Um, and I know that a lot of folks in your position and all the educators are, are really concerned about also the coming school year. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, we, it's one thing to get through what this year is, but a whole new school year in this way is something that's kind of hard to contemplate. And I know the governor's gonna make the big announcement in a couple of days on the 8th. So we're, we're gonna have to wait till then, but, um, how have you been planning for the coming school year, knowing that you may be back in the classroom or you may not? Um, I don't know how this affects, I, I can't imagine, it makes you have to plan doubly. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> so one of the things that our district, our superintendent actually addressed this in a live speak um, yesterday was we're gonna really be working towards um, streamlining as a district scope and sequences of learning based on what we know students um, were able to do this school year and what they may have missed. But also we're gonna try to streamline the platforms we use um, in case a situation like this occurs immediately in the fall or you know we have another uptick in COVID and do have to um, go back to remote learning partway through the year. So right now, you know, we have a lot of different platforms, Seesaw, um, Class Dojo, Google Meets, Google Hangouts, um, Google Classroom, Schoology, and how as a district can we streamline that for our families choosing just one platform right. um, and being able to work smarter, not harder as a district. So all the first grade teachers in the district getting together and developing a plan versus one teacher in isolation doing that work has really been the big topic this week. Um, and again, if we're back in school, it's gonna be a lot different and a little bit easier in some ways to assess where students are and what they're coming in with and make those adjustments on the spot. Well, just hearing you list all of those software, uh, you know, conferencing things, is that something that you were already an expert on or have you suddenly found yourself a quickly training in every kind of uh, communication technology possible? <laughs> uh, well, as a coach, um, I actually brought um, Seesaw to our district team and to many of the schools in the district. So that was a platform that I was pretty familiar with and have used when I was a classroom teacher myself. So that's been helpful. Um, I will say at Burke, we we're very fortunate. Uh, the technology um, teacher and I this fall offered a lot of PD around Google Meets um, and Google Classroom and Seesaw. So at Burke, we are pretty streamlined in what we're using and had offered a lot of training. So that's actually been this um, nice silver lining was that most people were fairly comfortable. Oh, so they were very lucky to have you uh, already very familiar with this technology. So you were ready to step right in. I can imagine it'd be very difficult to all of a sudden have to do this and your normal job too, <laughs> to have to learn that all of a sudden. And I can't say that's the case across our district. Um, you know, I've still been supporting other schools and getting Seesaw launched and some other platforms um, to help out just as a community of learners. So we're just all at very different levels. And one of the most inspiring things I've heard from teachers is, well, I can see how I'm gonna use this in the fall back in the classroom. This is a really great tool or a really great portfolio. So despite the 
really hard situation we're in. There have been some really great, as you said, silver linings around student choice, outdoor learning, and um, appropriate use of technology. Yeah, I'd like to think that after all this is over, our schools are going to be even better at doing what they do uh, because they'll have more tools at their disposal. But I also want to ask, you were saying about how the teachers are, uh, you know, stressed and doing so much work, uh, so devoted to their students that sometimes it might be, you know, causing them uh, all kinds of problems with their own lives. And I, I, how I know you as a coach, I have to support the teachers that in that respect as educators, but also, I don't know, are, have you found yourself having to be emotional support and also who's supporting you? Who's, who's there to back you up and uh, give you a, 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 you know, a comfort of counsel or something like that? So I will say um, we have been very fortunate as a district, um, our message from our leaders, both at a principal level and administrator has really been around personal wellness and making sure we're taking care of ourselves, whether that's going for a walk, um, turning off your email notifications on your phone so you don't see them anymore after a certain hour. Um, so really just finding that balance of knowing it's okay to get up, take a break when you're working from home, get that cup of tea, take your dog for a walk, whatever it might be. And those are some of the things that have helped me personally. You know, I am home with my lovely dog. And um, so finding balance with her and systems and what works to not bark through a whole Zoom meeting and what doesn't. Um, I will say there has definitely been a level of emotional support as a coach for teachers. And um, I also coordinate the district's mentoring program. And our focus really has been around how do we support teachers in supporting their students and recognizing these are all normal feelings. And sometimes we think we've got a handle on this new normal, um, both teaching and community, but then those feelings comes, come in waves um, and how we manage that. And I've been so fortunate that we have a really great leadership team at Burke in the district that support me in the work I do um, to make it all possible. Well, I, I, I only think uh, that the emotional support is something that has revealed that we're all humans. And I think, uh, you know, we need that as more than many people want to admit. And I, I, are there any students that you've worked with or that your teachers are working with that are really faring poorly? Like, I mean, I can only imagine there might be some kids who just I've really taken a, 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 a sad turn in all of this. I, I don't know, I, you, you have a school counselor too that mm -hmm. might be able to support, support in that respect, but I, I, have you, I, I hope not, but have you heard of any kids who've just really had a bad experience with this because it's too much for them? Um, I think in the beginning, that was a real hard shift for our students. And we were getting some feedback about how difficult this was and stressful. But I will say teachers in coordination with our leadership team, our guidance counselor, our home to school coordinator, we've been able to navigate those with families and students to adjust instruction, to bring it back to the bare minimum, what's expected, and really just acknowledge that everyone's in a different situation. And, you know, I can't speak to any one situation, um, but I think that it's taken a village to address those things as they come up. And we really just, again, rely on families giving us genuine feedback and students letting us know when it's become too much um, so we can make those adjustments. Now, uh, how long are you expecting to continue the, the formal education until the school year ended, you know, the original ending of school in June? Yep. So okay. the governor has said that we do need to provide a continuity of education um, through our normal date. We have not at this point um, as teachers received any knowledge and yesterday it was reconfirmed to us that we will be going um, till our expected end date in June. Well, because my next question is about, um, I know that summer usually it means less connection with the students in the school. Uh, and I know that in the from the curriculum side, there's always a concern about the, the summer slide or when I mean, some kids go backwards in their skill retention because they've been out of practice. But this is a different situation altogether this year. Uh, summer, it, it, I don't think about the summer slide, but just the disconnection part of it. Um, how uh, have you made any plans that are different from a normal summer for sort of keeping uh, in touch with some of the families and some of the, the, the teachers working with the kids? I mean, 
this is outside of the normal scope of education, but everything is out of normal <laughs> now. Yeah, everything is out of normal. It's definitely been something weighing on my mind, how to continue to connect with teachers as they plan for their instruction in the fall. Um, as to how they plan to connect with students and our districts, um, focus on summer supports. I can't speak to that. I know it's something that has definitely come up, um, but the, in regards to anything formal, I can't speak to that at this point. Yeah, that, I think that's a challenge for the whole region as a, as a community to figure out how to get, uh, you know, keep kids connected with their education mm -hmm. so that this summer will benefit them as instead of being a, a, a wash. I mean, I, I think education happens all the time, not just in school, but um, is uh, Katie, we're, we're low on time. We only have a few minutes left, but uh, is there anything that you would like to convey uh, to the community, whether it be kids, parents, uh, uh, other teachers, and even uh, the folks that are adults that don't have children in the school system? Because sometimes those folks are a little bit removed from the schools and they don't realize all the things that are going on. I mean, I have been so impressed just hearing what you're saying. I realize that your job is much harder than normal. Uh, and there's a lot of uncertainty, a lot of worries about budgets and votes coming up. So I don't know if there's anything along the lines that you want to give up to the whole community on what all of us can do to help support the folks at your school and people like you and the kids that you work with. I think just continuing um, as a community to support educators, acknowledge that this is a difficult position for parents, students, teachers, administrators, everyone involved in the education realm of the COVID situation, but also to think about learning as a little bit different than what we would expect in a textbook and reading that it's about the learning process about you know engaging in reading building a love for reading and um, more authentic counting measuring cooking um, and just to think a little bit more creatively about how we engage students in that process and thinking not about the final product, I think particularly about writing. Um, you know, it's not published and polished, but they were able to come up with an idea. They were able to um, share the moments of a story, beginning, middle, end, come up with a creative character and describe their traits. So really not putting pressure on meeting a particular standard, but just continuing to grow and really foster assets for students. Well, I, I I completely agree with everything you've said about the value of learning. I, I'm a firm believer that it, learning is not just something you do at a school. It's your lifelong passion. And I, I believe that. I always try to promote that to everyone. Um, I, I'm just curious to find out. It's going to probably take years to know, but the kids that you worked with this these couple of years are going to stand out in one way or another uh, when you look at assessments and all that going down in the future, maybe five, 10 years from now when they're in high school. I wonder, I, well, I think that they may have benefited from all this because if anything, your curriculum seems to be fostering also a sort of uh, independent study, a self-motivated study. Uh, and, and these are things that are gonna benefit them for the rest of their lives. So um, I, I'm happy that, that, that you're advocating that. And I really love uh, your emphasis on doing things with like sticks and rocks and flowers outside in nature. Uh, you know, maybe one more thing I should suggest is uh, getting into sourdough baking. That's been one of the best benefits for me. <laughs> Learn about. <that. laughs> you know, and I think, as you said, it's just it's an opportunity for us to look at education and think about what's really important and how can we continue as we either continue remotely or come back into our classrooms. Um, to personalize learning, to meet students' individual interests and use the spaces around us creatively to foster that. Well, I, I'm confident that with folks like you on the, on the task uh, that this is only gonna make our educational system better. Um, instead of being a, a terrible time to get through, it'll, it'll end up becoming a renaissance uh, you know, of, of educational style. So uh, unfortunately our time is just about up, Katie, but um, I want to wish you well, and I hope you get the emotional support you need so that you uh, can continue to be there uh, for all those teachers. Um, unless there's any last things you would like to say to us. Uh, I'm, I'm just grateful that you were able to spend time with us. And also, I'm grateful that the kids that you work with have someone like you looking out for their education and helping to improve it. So 
Um, thank you so much for joining us. Um, I don't know if there's any last things you would like to say. I don't think we've got any questions from the public, unfortunately, but I would love to hear from the public. So, uh, Katie. I just want to say thank you for having me. And, you know, my work is to support teachers. So I want to wish all teachers a happy Teacher Appreciation Week to wrap up our time for all the hard work that they've been doing. Is that this week? Oh, I should, this week. I should have started with that. It's <laughs> one of those things that uh, slips the mind in these times. But Teacher Appreciation Week, well, what a, we couldn't have had a better guest for that. So thank you, Katie, for joining us. And uh, I, I hope that all the kids you work with, uh, you know, uh, continue to benefit and continue to go outside and make the best of these times. Uh, but anyway, I'm glad you could join us. And uh, Leela, did we get any questions in from any of our sources? Uh, no, no, but you guys have done a, a really wonderful job just highlighting all the things that um, are all the positive things that are being done and how we can reinforce those positive things. So I really appreciate you guys um, just talking all this through. So thank you to Sean. Thank you to Katie. And especially thank you, Bobby, for hosting this whole um, COVID-19 update today. It was, it's huge. <laughs> so it's awesome. Well, I, my, our guests gave us lots of reasons to smile despite the bad news. So I'm grateful for them for that. So thank you, Katie. And yes, thanks, Sean. And thank you, Leela, for hosting this on short notice. L this is not usually Leela's gig, but <laughs> she stepped in on the last minute and she did a perfectly uh, a great job at it. So thank yeah. you. And uh, everyone out there watching, stay well. And uh, we'll see you next Wednesday for the next COVID-19 update. Thank you, Katie. Thanks. See ya. Bye. <laughs>